I'm Susan Marvin, the director of the Florida Dispute Resolution Center. I'm Susan Marvin, and my co-presenter today is Kimberly Kosh. Kimberly is the Dispute Resolution Center's Senior Court Operations Consultant. We're very happy to be with you today, and we are presenting the best of MEAC, Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee Opinions. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the FL Court's webpage uh, YouTube channel. Please put your questions in your, and your email address and name in the chat function, and we will answer the questions either during the presentation or by email within one week of the presentation. So we'll reply by email if you send us that information and we did not get to your question. Once you registered to attend today, you should have received a confirmation email with a link to the materials in that email, as well as a reminder email with that same link. We will also be sending you an email after the presentation thanking you for your attendance and the link to the materials will be in that email as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to email us at drcmail at flcourts.org and we have staff who are responding to that email as we speak if you need something. The materials you will find using the link contain the certificate of attendance, which lists the CME credits and the Florida Bar CLE information if you are going to use your attendance for CLE. We usually get a few questions about those items. And Kimberly is going to kick us off with some information about the Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee. And thank you, Susan. And um, I did have one attendee ask us how we could be outside in front of the Supreme Court, which made me chuckle. We're not outside on this cold, wintry day, but we um, do um, wish you all well. Um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as many of you know, the Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee accepts written questions from certified or court appointed mediators and renders opinions that are for a benefit of all mediators. Um, you can submit a question to the MEAC. It is not a hotline, however, it does take anywhere from 90 to 120 days to receive a written answer. Um, the question and the answer are posted on the website for the benefit of all mediators. And on the screen in front of you, you have um, the information that's available on our website about contacting the MEAC. The MEAC is a nine member committee um, and those members serve from around the state. They meet once a month um, to review and go over the questions that have been posed. Um, and and um, we have a almost a 25 year history of uh, MEAC opinions. So um, the on our website, flcourts.org, there is a whole section devoted to MEAC opinions. And those opinions are available by subject matter index, and we'll go over that in the next slide, or chronologically, um, by the year that they were rendered. Um, in the last 25 years, the MEAC has issued 246 opinions, which on average is about 10 opinions a year. Um, the MEAC is um, actually, the authority for the MEAC is found in the rules for certified and court appointed mediators. And it's within section three, which is the disciplinary section. And the impetus for having the MEAC is so that mediators can ask questions and be, be provided ethical guidance. And um, we provide this service so that you will not be involved in the dis disciplinary process and that you will have um, a way to get guidance on, on what the rules require and what they don't. 
Um, in today's webinar, we are only going to cover about 24 opinions, which is less than 10% or just about 10% of all of the opinions um, that have been rendered. So um, I we use the title, The Best of the MEAC. Um, we have culled through the opinions and we have picked out those that represent um, questions from all six subject matter areas that we have uh, the opinions divided into. And we, um, in looking at those six subject matter areas, which are on your screen now, we went through and uh, picked out those opinions, which we reference the most in the trainings that we conduct, and those opinions which we send out to the field based on inquiries that come to the DRC. So our staff, um, Susan and I, and our senior attorney, Juan Collins, are always willing to talk with mediators and um, go over our rules with you. But if you call the DRC for any type of ethical guidance on an area, the first thing that all of us are going to do is go to the issued MEAC opinions because there's such a wide variety in depth to see if the question has already been answered um, by this uh, group so that you have um, something to, to rely on in writing um, to proceed with your um, mediations and, and the questions that you have before you. We have also uh, focused our attention on those opinions which um, may be the benefit of the most of individuals who are working for the courts and this uh, webinar is initially offered as part of our CME series for staff, volunteer, and contract mediators working in the court. So you will see that the six subject matter areas that the MEAC opinions are divided into, and when I say they're divided into, when a MEAC opinion is re released, uh, DRC staff assign it to one of these subject matter areas. We know that some opinions cross over topic areas. For example, one of the first opinions that I'm going to cover today on advertising, advertising and marketing has reference to um, references to the conflicts of interest. So that opinion could have been perhaps um, put into that subject matter area. We do the best that we can in dividing these opinions into different areas so that when you go to look for a MEAC opinion, um, you don't have to search all 246 to find the opinion that's most applicable to you. Um, there's also uh, on our um, index, uh, when you bring up any one of these six subject matter areas, there is an index that appears with um, very similar to the um, material, the information that's in the materials where we have the reference of the year, uh, the MEAC opinion year, and the summary of the opinion in the rules cited. And while we do have and rely on those summaries, we do encourage all mediators to read the full opinion and not just rely on the summary. And we do that because the MEAC opinions are based on the facts that are presented to us in the question. So while some summaries can be translated across different types of practice areas, it may be that the answer to the question was based on a rule of procedure. And as you may know from our past CME webinars, the rules of procedure across our five certification areas vary. And what might be the appropriate course of action under a rule of procedure for county mediation may be different than that for family mediation. So in your materials, um, if you have downloaded them, they are quite lengthy. We have provided not only the summary of the opinions that we are going to cover, but we have also included all of the, um, the original opinions. So um, if you have not printed them yet, you may want to only print out select ones. The materials are 111 pages long. We decided to be very comprehensive in providing these to you, but it may be that not all of them need to be um, printed out for your benefit. So without further ado, I am going to cover uh, the first three subject matter areas of advertising and marketing, advice, opinions, and information, 
and business practices. And then Susan will um, take over the presentation for confidentiality, conflicts of interest, and procedures. And like she said, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers, um, time permitting. If we don't get to your question, like Susan said, if you provide your name and email, we will be in touch with you to get an answer to your question. So the first opinion I'm covering under advertising and marketing, and we have decided to uh, review three opinions in each category. Um, so the first opinion that um, I'm looking at is advertising and marketing 2010-001. And this question has to do with whether a certified mediator may designate mediation clients um, as friends on social media sites. And the opinion says that yes, you can do that. However, a mediator should keep in mind that by doing so, they may limit the clients with whom the mediator would work. So there's not an outright prohibition against that, but looking in the rules that the MEAC relied upon, um, they suggested that, um, that appropriate disclosures be made. So if we look at, and what they largely based their opinion on was not only um, our, all of our rules, but on conflicts of interest. So um, we know as mediators that if there is a relationship um, that would impair the mediator's impartiality, the mediator has a duty to disclose those relationships. So not every relationship that you have with someone, if it doesn't rise to the level of impairing your impartiality needs to be disclosed. And that, um, that litmus test is, is a large part of what the, me, the full MEAC opinion is based on. Um, and the MEAC opinion also talks about um, the levels of friendships that one may have. Um, as you may know or may um, have your own Facebook page, um, some people have a lot of people on there in the, in the people who are designated friends may not be friends as we consider those in a social setting, but, but more professional acquaintances. Um, however, um, anyone going to your Facebook page who sees that someone is your friend and then subsequently is mediating with you um, may very well feel like that you would not be impartial in that case. So the, Me the MEAC does um, suggest that if you have a friend designated that you make that appropriate disclosure and that you make that disclosure as soon as as possible, um, at, and uh, the committee note to rule 10.340 on conflict of interest says that the mediator should alert the parties at the earliest possible opportunity that allows all parties the self-determination for selecting the mediator and moving forward with the mediation. So I would tell you that an, on, on this particular opinion, it would, um, and as the MEAC advises, to err on the side of caution and make those disclosures. Um, our next MEAC opinion um, is 2002-003. So we're going back a while in time here. And this question really um, kind of, uh, the answer to the question kind of summarizes what the question was uh, fairly succinctly. This opinion states that the generic description of certified mediator is inherently misleading and is a violation of the advertising and marketing practice rule 10.610. Um, and in that opinion, um, what the 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 um, some someone who had a circuit certification um, was advertising themselves as a certified mediator, and the MEAC opined that without clarity, one could assume that the mediator was certified in other areas or all areas of mediation, and that was misleading. 
So um, we do see from time to time at the DRC, we'll receive an email letter correspondence where um, that term is used. And um, we usually provide the MEAC opinion back in those instances just to alert mediators that you have to at least list one area of certification. You don't have to list all if you don't want to, you have that discretion, but using just certified mediator is not is not appropriate. Going back to the uh, the first year that the MEAC rendered opinions in 1995-006, um, the MEAC opined that it is inappropriate for a certified mediator to use the state seal or Supreme Court of Florida seal in any advertisements without express permission. Um, and amazingly, we do get this question. I got this question just this year from a mediator. And it is, um, I, I do see where mediators, because you are certified by the Florida Supreme Court, um, assume that that seal is eligible to be used. But unless you have gotten permission, it is not. Um, and in the full opinion, the um, facts state that for the Supreme Court seal, the court determined that use by mediators of the seal on business cards and letterhead is, a, is inappropriate. And they made that decision during court conference in 1994. So I will tell you, this is, the, this is one of the oldest MEAC opinions that I regularly um, send out or reference or get questions on. So an, an oldie, uh, but a goodie. All right. Um, moving on to the next section on advice, opinions, and information. This opinion says that a mediator may not refer a party to a specific lawyer or not-for-profit advocacy group when conducting when contacted by the party after a mediation. Such referral would be inconsistent with the mediator's duty to remain impartial throughout the mediation process. And in this scenario, the mediator was contacted after the mediation was over. The, media, the, the um, party was pro se. And the mediator did know a, a local attorney who worked in the area. Now at the mediation proper, the mediator did advise the party upon certain questioning that um, he, he or she may need to seek the advice of an attorney and made that general disclosure that's required if a mediator believes that the party does not appreciate or understand um, how an agreement may affect their legal rights. Um, but this was a little bit different. So um, the MEAC um, opined that your impartiality and neutrality um, does not end at the, at, when the session is over, but should continue throughout the process. So making a referral to a particular mediator would not be a neutral act um, and should be avoided. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this opinion than I have on the other ones because I think it's so important. This one is 2009-007. Um, the summary of this opinion states, consistent with the standards of impartiality and preserving party self-determination, a mediator may provide information that the mediator is qualified by training or experience to provide. If the mediator's explanation of a judgment is consistent with rule 10.370A, then the mediator may provide that information. So let's start with the first sentence. Um, the first sentence of this rule um, really hinges on the clause at the very beginning, consistent with the standards of impartiality in preserving party self-determination. So if you use that as your sieve, not all information that you know and that you're qualified by training or experience to provide will pass through. 
So this rule does not allow and should not be read starting with a mediator may provide because you have an ongoing obligation to be impartial in the information that you provide. Most information might favor one party over the other. And that would violate your impartiality and neutrality. So you need to be very careful on what type of information you share under this rule. The question that came into the MEAC, and I'm going to read it because I have a feeling that um, many of you who practice in county court mediation have experienced or perhaps talked about this. The question that was posed to the MEAC reads, our county court mediators have had a lively discussion on whether if during the mediation conference, a defendant asked the mediator for an explanation of a judgment, is it appropriate for the mediator to provide such explanation? This question is primarily raised during credit card cases. Some of the mediators are of the opinion that providing such information may be construed as legal advice and others do not. Several mediators have asked the plaintiff's counsel if she or he would be willing to provide an explanation of a judgment. That practice, however, seems to open other issues in that while some attorneys will provide an explanation with a disclaimer that they do not represent the defendant, the explanation may be as simple as it's a piece of paper signed by the judge that you owe money without explaining any consequences. I would appreciate your opinion on this issue. So the MEAC opined the summary that you see there, they also uh, went on to offer examples of what a mediator could be able to provide under this rule that meets both the standards of um, impartiality and neutrality and providing information that you have experience. So for example, a mediator could provide copies of informational sheets on court matters and definitions if available, provide Florida Bar pamphlets on the subject matter, repeat instructions or information made by the judge prior to entering the mediation, or and discuss and read language on court forms. So many of uh, many of, of you county mediators mediate in the small claims area, and traditionally you do that after pretrial conference, and it is not unusual for the judge or some other court official to make some introductory comments, um, including those about judgments and interests. So if the judges are making those types of comments, mediators can feel free to repeat them in the mediation. But again, um, you need to be careful that the information you're providing does not cross the line into uh, legal advice. And, um, and the Med MEAC concludes this opinion by saying it is not appropriate for a mediator to ask a plaintiff's counsel to provide legal information or advice to a pro se defendant in this case. So again, this is MEAC 2009-007. Um, and uh, going back to uh, questions on legal advice and information, we have opinion 1995-002. Uh, the question that originally came into the MEAC for this question asked if the mediator could ask, uh, provide legal information if posed as a question rather than a statement. So the, the opinion, the author of the opinion asks if it's okay to ask the parties, are you aware that monthly payments do not cover interest as it is accruing and you will be paying on this loan forever? And also wanted to know if asking this question was appropriate. Are you aware that if a judgment were entered against you, the interest rate would be reduced from 29.5% to 8%. The MEAC opined that neither of these questions um, uh, are appropriate and um, you should not be providing legal advice disguised in question form. 
Um, moving on to business practices, which is my last category, we have opinion 2019-006. This opinion codifies that if a duly scheduled mediation is not conducted, the mediator may report to the court that the mediation was not held. The mediator may, but is not required to report parties who attended or did not attend the mediation. However, a mediator shall not include mediation communications in the report. And the MEAC declined to answer or offer guidance on best practices for cancellation windows, but did provide guidance on assessment of fees. In this question, the mediator asked whether or not it would be appropriate to include in the report the amount owed due to the cancellation and identifying the party that caused the cancellation um, and some other information. And um, as, as we have been repeating in our fall CME series, you are very limited on what you can report to the court after a mediation. In civil areas, you are to uh, report agreement, no agreement, partial agreement, or adjournment without comment or recommendation. And in the family area, the rules of procedure allow you to report in instances of no agreement very limited information with the consent of the parties. So um, putting in information about uh, fees that are owed or the party causing the cancellation is inappropriate. And um, in terms of the practice of reporting who is at mediation, that is uh, that sentence relies on the fact that there is no rule of procedure or statewide rule that requires you to identify the parties who appeared or those who did did not appear. However, um, oftentimes there may be local court rules which provide guidance on um, how reports will be made. So if your local court requests that you identify the parties who are present, um, you, uh, we advise that you follow that rule and there's nothing that prohibits you from doing so. And in the absence of a, a local court rule, there's nothing that compels you um, to identify those parties um, or um, any other in information. Okay, going on to 2014-005, um, most of you, I, I think you would know that the mediator's fee can never be based on the outcome of a mediation. And in this question, um, the mediator um, didn't wasn't asking whether or not their fee would be changed uh, based on the outcome of the uh, of the mediation but rather whether a fee would be assessed or not. So the mediator wanted to uh, advertise that she had a money back guarantee and that if you came to mediation and the case did not settle, that you would not be charged a fee. In the MIAC opine that that was a not appropriate, that um, you that uh, advertising and marketing in such a way would be vital of the rules. In um, MEAC 2001-001, the MEAC confirmed that the, a mediator cannot receive a referral, cannot offer or accept a referral fee. However, a mediator can be compensated for the work that he or she has done on a particular case. In examples of um, work that may be done was given, which includes coordination, scheduling, noticing, billing, and collection of mediation fees. Um, there are probably other areas and examples. Uh, for example, if you had already secured mediation summaries from the parties, 
or if you were using, and the MEAC opinion does reference if you're using office space, those things um, you could charge for, but you could not per se charge a referral fee. And Susan, with that, I'm going to turn it over for, to you. Thank you, Kimberly. I feel like I'm on a world tour and we're covering six countries in an hour. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about these important topics. And uh, as I was preparing, I just was reminded of what I used to do when I was mediating. And that is I carried with me the rules booklet to my mediations. And if something came up that I didn't know how to handle, I took a mediator caucus and I snuck a peek at those rules. Just a suggestion. I'm going to talk about confidentiality and two other meaty topics, uh, conflicts of interest and uh, procedures in mediation. So um, we start out with confidentiality, MEAC 2013-001. And this opinion is probably pretty interesting to those of you who mediate in county courts, small claims particularly. Um, it involves four questions regarding mediation reports and the signing or failure to sign mediation agreements by parties who appear in small claims court uh, telephonically. Of course, this was in the day when parties were appearing telephonically now we're in the age where maybe more parties are appearing through video conferencing and for all we know that may continue so uh, this may be particularly relevant to us uh, now so in answer uh, to these many questions the MEAC uh, said that it's a breach of confidentiality for a certified mediator to report to the court that a party who appears telephonically or by other electronic means, video conferencing, pursuant to court order, failed to return the signed agreement after verbally agreeing to sign it. And I'm gonna lump one and two together. If a party appearing by phone fails to sign a return an agreement after agreeing to do so, that is a confidential mediation communication. So we know that mediation begins when the order is issued to go to mediation. That's in section 44.404 Perrin 1, Florida statutes. And a mediation ends, court ordered mediation ends when the agreement is signed, the mediator declares no agreement and reports it to the court or a mediation is terminated uh, for, you know, in some circumstance. So that's kind of our overall frame of reference here. The rules uh, for certified and court appointed mediators, rule 10.360A says, of course, that a mediator shall maintain confidentiality of all information revealed during mediation, except where disclosure is required or permitted by law or is agreed to by all parties. So when a party fails to return a signed agreement, in a telephonic or other electronic uh, mediation, and they're appearing uh, remotely, um, their failure to return the signed mediation agreement is considered a mediation communication. That's what the MEAC said in this opinion. And that's under chapter 44, section 44, uh, 44.4031. Um, it's nonverbal conduct intended to make an assertion by a mediation participant made during the course of a mediation that if you don't return your signed agreement. The communication doesn't qualify as one of the exceptions to confidentiality, so it is confidential. Um, also, Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1.730B requires that an agreement be reduced to writing and signed by the parties and their counsel, if any. So if a party appears electronically or by telephone uh, pursuant to a court order, that requirement is not waived. 
In other words, unless everybody signs, all the parties sign the mediation agreement, it's not an agreement. The third question was about the mediation unit. So if you're part of a unit, the unit can't report to the court that a party has repeatedly not returned signed mediation agreements after agreeing to do so. That would be a breach of confidentiality. And the MIAT gave some suggestions about what the, MIAT, uh, the mediation unit could do, but uh, you just want to note that the mediation unit is an extension or representative of the mediator. And in that capacity, the unit is also bound by the rules and statutes that regulate mediators, which makes sense. Uh, the fourth question, a notification to the court that the mediator is waiting for signatures for an agreement is also a breach of confidentiality. Again, an agreement without, without all the required signatures is not an agreement and to report that uh, you're waiting for signatures would be a comment and that would violate rule 1.730 of the rules of civil procedure for uh, reports, right? So that would be uh, confidential information. Moving to MEAC 2012-001, uh, which is the next uh, slide. Kimberly. Oh, sorry, Susan. <laughs> no problem. Um, this question is, if a party to a mediation indicates either directly or indirectly that he or she is suicidal during a mediation session, is the mediator permitted to disclose this information to an outside party, like a law enforcement officer or someone else, or is that information considered confidential? Hopefully you don't have this come up very often, but uh, it's good to know what to do. It is permissible for a certified mediator to disclose mediation communications that are confidential. So we just have to figure out what is confidential. In the example provided, the mediator may disclose information to an outside party um, such as a law enforcement officer. That's what the MEAC said. And their reasoning is uh, communications, verbal or nonverbal, that threaten violence are not confidential. So that's one of those exceptions to confidentiality that you want to remember. Hence, uh, you know, that's why I carry the rules around um, the rules booklet that probably includes chapter 44 if I can't remember all these things. So for that MEAC opinion, you want to see section 44.405 and the list of exceptions to confidentiality, but it's parent two that says um, any mediation uh, communication that is willfully used to plan a crime, commit or attempt to commit a crime, conceal ongoing criminal activity or threaten violence is not confidential. And the MEAC didn't distinguish between communications that threaten violence to oneself or someone else. They also noted that communications which threaten violence do not require a mandatory report as is required for communications which reveal child or vulnerable adult abuse. And that's a different uh, part of confidentiality. Um, the MEAC provided some guidelines for disclosing the information. So you want to look at that opinion for those guidelines. Moving to MEAC 2003-005. Um, this one is specific to caucus confidentiality and provides some clarification for that. Uh, the answer was that a, medi a mediator may establish a ground rule for the mediation that nothing in caucus will be deemed confidential unless a party specifically indicates that it should be confidential. As long as the party expressly consents to that procedure. So um, we know that rule 10.360B provides that information obtained during caucus 
may not be revealed by the mediator to any other participant without the consent of the disclosing party. But neither that rule or any other mediator rule um, mandate a procedure by which a party may waive the right to confidentiality. So uh, you just need to get the person's consent and you can't imply consent from a lack of objection or by the party sitting mute, the opinion says. So, um, you know, mediators have different practices for uh, what they do with caucus confidentiality. The reverse of the procedure that's spoken of in this MEAC opinion would be the, the practice of saying everything in caucus is confidential unless a party specifically indicates that it's not. So uh, you just need to read that opinion and decide what approach you're going to use in caucus and be sure to get the party's consent, the MEAC said. Moving to the also meaty topic of conflicts of interest, we go to MEAC 2018-001. So um, this is about several questions regarding language a mediator included in their settlement agreement. The language, I think this mediator was trying to avoid uh, having a complaint filed by them uh, with the Mediator Qualifications and Discipline Review Board. So the language that the mediator put in their settlement agreement form what detailed the mediator's compliance with the ethical rules, uh, all of the ethical rules, by stating that during the mediation, the mediator did not give legal advice or opinions, was impartial, did not make decisions for the parties, and stated that the parties relied on their attorney's advice. The MEAC said that settlement agreement language inserted into an agreement by the mediator regarding the mediator's compliance with the ethical rules, doesn't promote or respond to the needs and interests of the parties, may create an obstacle to the parties signing the agreement, which would otherwise memorialize their agreed upon terms, and may result in the parties feeling coerced to agree to additional substantive language regarding ethical issues extraneous to their dispute in order to sign their written agreement. The language adds to the written agreement substantive terms which would not have been raised by the parties. The parties don't usually uh, go to a mediation and negotiate whether or not the mediator's acting ethically. So the terms benefit the mediator and not the parties. And if you thought about inter uh, including such language in your settlement agreement, you should definitely take a look at that opinion. Next is MEAC 2017-002. And this one is um, consistent with some other MEAC opinions that the committee has issued. Uh, that a, MEA, uh, a mediator shall not perform the dual role of mediator and translator or interpreter. Um, so, in this opinion, the inquirer asked seven questions regarding a variety of circumstances in mediation involving spoken language interpretation and written translation of a mediation agreement. If you continue to have questions regarding those issues in mediation, please carefully read this opinion. It has a lot of information. I'm going to summarize that information um, just to say that uh, the conflict of interest rule 10.340D provides that a mediator shall not create a conflict of interest um, and by providing services that aren't directly related to the mediation process. Uh, the committee affirmed an earlier opinion in which they had opined that the mediator can't serve in the dual roles of mediator and translator or interpreter. Going to MEAC 2008-008, uh, 
Um, this opinion says there is a clear conflict of interest when a mediator having mediated a dispute subsequently represents or otherwise takes a position for or against a former party in a related matter. The mediator here was asked to serve as an expert witness on appellate attorney's fees in a matter that the mediator had meted, mediated the attorney's fees at the trial level. So the, the mediation took place at the trial level, one of the parties appealed, and now both parties uh, separately asked the mediator to serve as an expert witness on appellate attorney's fees. So the MEAC noted that a clear conflict of interest can't be waived under Rule 10.340C. And because Rule 10.620 precludes a mediator from accepting any engagement or providing any service compromising the mediator's integrity or impartiality, a lawyer mediator in the circumstances described will be similarly precluded from providing expert testimony on behalf of either party to a prior mediation. I, I believe that would apply to a not lawyer mediator also. Although I think in this opinion, the MIAC was referring to some other opinions involving lawyer mediators. We are going to move to my last subject matter area, which is procedures, and look at MEAC 2019-004. This one was interesting. The inquiry concerned whether it's ethical for a mediator to require the presence of children in family mediation so that the parents have to face the children and tell them to their face whether or not they are willing to pay child support for the, for the children's care. So um, picture that. The MIA confirmed that self-determination is a bedrock principle of mediation, of course, and rule 10.310A, self-determination, states that decisions made during mediation are to be made by the parties. So that includes who is and is not going to attend the mediation, uh, as you know. You probably want to read any of the MIAC opinions about who makes those kind of decisions if you have any questions about that. Um, so mediators, the MIAC said, should also be mindful of the Florida statutes, procedure rules, local rules regarding children attending court proceedings and mediation. We go to 2017-006. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's the one you have up. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and Kimberly already spoke some about this. A mediator may report agreement, no agreement, or partial agreement to the court without comment or recommendation. So we're not allowed to put any other descriptors or modifiers in the mediator report unless the parties have consented to them in writing. And this opinion has helpful information about what the various rules of procedure require and, and all of the things that are required in mediator reports. So if you need uh, those rules of procedure, just look at 2017-006, it's got a list. Going to 2015-001, which is my final opinion. Um, this one was specific to a dependency mediator and noted that many attorneys and case managers now open laptops and tablets to access, access online case plans and other documents uh, that they would have electronically. So they're at a dependency mediation and some of the participants open their laptops and start typing. And the mediator asked uh, two professional participants not to type on their laptops or tablets during the mediation. That mediator had been told by some of the parents who attend dependency mediation 
that they felt intimidated by the constant clacking of the keys and the uncertainty of what the actual uh, what, what was actually being documented about them during the mediation. The mediator was uh, appropriately concerned about mediation confidentiality. And the MEAC stated that certified mediators don't have the authority to ban the use of laptop devices or tablets during mediation. Um, there is no rule of procedure or mediator rule prohibiting the use of those uh, devices. And the parties, again, going back to self-determination, need to make the decisions about how devices are gonna be used during their mediation and uh, any other matter regarding those devices in the mediation. So once again, the, uh, the MEAC said, let the parties talk about it and make that decision. And that's a great place to wrap up uh, what I'm saying, Kimberly. And okay. um, based on the bedrock of self-determination. All right, great. Thank you, Susan. And um, we have gotten some questions and I, I appreciate that we have gotten um, some wonderful inquiries. And um, as you were speaking, I was multitasking and answering some of those. So some of you have gotten answers to your questions. Um, but if I may, I would like to um, kind, uh, direct our uh, attention in this last couple of minutes with you to um, several of your inquiries that have been asked um, in, in different forms. And Susan, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you for uh, your opinion and interpretation as I have, um, have a habit of doing. So, um, and, and honestly, even before today's webinar, I got two questions from mediators around the state on this very question. In, in the times that we're now in, where many mediations are not being conducted in person, um, the agreements are um, being drawn up um, and having to be sent to the parties um, electronically or um, even draft, perhaps drafted after the mediation and, and then circulated for signature. We have a number of mediators asking if the, if the mediator can report waiting for signatures or it will be returned or verbal confirmation received, a, a agreement validated. Are any of those things allowed or permitted by our procedural rules? And do you have any best practice tips for mediators? You know, Kimberly, don't you just love it when there's a MEAC opinion that answers your questions? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I would direct those uh, people who are asking those questions, and they're very good questions, especially now, to MEAC 2013-001. It has, uh, as I mentioned, a really thorough discussion of those kind of issues. And, um, you know, the importance is mediation confidentiality and abiding by the rules and the statute, despite the fact that we're in this very um, widespread uh, age of video conferencing mediation. And, and that, that uh, MEAC opinion actually suggests that the mediator and the mediation program may want to create some best practices that they all go by and that would be uh informing the, the particularly well now if we're in video conferencing everyone's participating that way informing the parties there is a there's a deadline here's what our deadline is for returning the signature and by the way if you don't meet that deadline we can't report that there is an agreement and you will be put back in the queue for whatever the next court procedure is. So it's in your own best interest to return the signature by the deadline or um, you know, your case is going to keep coming around for more procedures. And, and, and that would seem to um, fit in with uh, many of the questions that we ha have received. Um, one of the questions that um, we, we have, which might be a little bit outside of the mediator's purview, but 
um, was asking, how does the court know what has happened to that case unless we immediately report what has happened? Well, again, that's why the unit would want to come up with their uh, ideal time frame for filing the mediator's report. And, you know, maybe it's uh, what uh, the person has to sign. I, I don't know what they think is the ideal time frame, but within 24 hours, within 48 hours, within a certain number of days. And uh, if that agreement isn't signed and returned by all the parties uh, by that deadline, then the mediator's report would be filed and it would either say no agreement or adjournment. But adjournment should be if all the parties agree to an adjournment. So, um, you know, whoever is uh, over that program needs to uh, sit down and make some decisions. Do you have anything you would add to that? Um, no, no, I think you've done a great job. And I, I have said before that case management should not be a secret. However, there are certain duties that are the mediators and there are cer certain duties that belong to the court. So that uh, a mediation department having clear guidance on um, what, what, the, what the deadline and return dates are, um, we did get a, a very interesting question from a small claims mediator who, who says, and you and I both have practiced in small claims, that they don't have a mechanism individually for reporting. So if you volunteer you know, at pretrial every Tuesday and, and the, uh, the practices allow a media, you know, the parties 10 days, you the mediator, you know, and often as a volunteer might not have um, the ability to do that. And I think then that we would call upon the mediation unit to take upon um, that duty to submit the accurate report in those instances. Um, do you think that would be best guidance? That sounds reasonable to me. And, and again, I, I, I can see that the mediation programs would need to sit down and come up with some policies and procedures that would help their mediators. Right. And um, while we do have a minute or two left, um, if you are um, on this webinar or watching it afterward and you are the director, the coordinator, the supervisor of a mediation program, let's just give you a huge round of applause. Um, the ADR programs in the state when um, kind of the curtain COVID came down in March pivoted on a dime, literally, to offering their services remotely. It was um, unbelievable how quickly um, they, they offered those services and what a tremendous asset um, the service mediation has been during this time when um, certainly civil trials have um, you know, minimized greatly or are not even being offered. Um, so, if, if this, um, if our session has raised more questions and answers in work for you, um, small apologies, but we know that you can do it. You have done so much for the state over this last year. And to those of you who have continued to mediate and especially to volunteer in the small claims court, um, your world has been turned upside down from coming to court and perhaps um, having some type of um, collegial inter interaction with your, your peers to being perhaps, um, you know, siloed into a, a Zoom webinar. Um, so I can't, I cannot tell you um, or understate how impressed I am with all of our professionals around the state. I definitely second everything you said, Kimberly. Um, you know, uh, fortunately, mediators have helped many parties resolve their disputes and not have to wait during uh, this time. And right. we can't say enough how much the court system appreciates everyone. And, and we do know, Susan, that uh, the remote proceedings have been um, very helpful to the litigants um, as well. Um, some we have heard anecdotally from our peers around the state that in different areas of mediation, the participant attendance has actually increased um, because parties no longer need to take perhaps a whole day off from work to attend a very small 
uh, you know, not very small, but a, a time limited uh, court proceeding. So um, it, it's possible that remote proceedings in ADR will continue even after it is safe to gather again. Yes, I think that's a very real possibility. Right. And um, so I always think that um, that um, the new normal, whatever that will be, is not going to look like what we had had in the state before March. And um, to some extent, I've gone through a little bit of the grieving process that some things um, may never go back to the way they were, but with a little bit of excitement for uh, changing times and it, opportunities in the future. Yes, and uh, trying to have the, a good attitude about uh, being excited that we can be a part of these major transformations that do benefit many of the court participants. Right. So um, with, with that, we're going we're gonna to close our webinar for today. We really appreciate you being with us. Susan, we had about 150 mediators from across the state, which I think is one of our records. So, um, and this also concludes our fall winter CME series. We have enjoyed it tremendously. Um, we will be doing it again, um, but we will be taking a small hiatus and we will be making those announcements when we're back online through your ADR director and ADR programs. Um, so we wish you well until we see you again. Yes, and be sure to read your MIAC opinions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank Bye. you.